Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are ready to begin. I'm Elizabeth Kahn, and I'm the founding president and CEO of the Onward Project. Um, this was to be a live event in late March, but unfortunately, due to COVID-19, um, we now have an online presentation, and it is our first. Um, the silver lining is that many can join us from around the country. We have people from New Mexico, from New York, uh, Maryland, Minnesota, Navajo Nation, and uh, DC. So I know that all of us have been affected so much by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, some profoundly and tragically. Um, I guess what we plan to do is use our platform as others will to keep the issues that were raised during the pandemic in the forefront um, so that solutions can be found for health issues and other basic services in isolated communities and tribal nations around the country and around the world. It's also a time of social adjustment. Uh, I'm reminded in the past months of the power of narrative. Um, certainly the national and international reaction to the killing of George Floyd illustrates this so profoundly and continues to. I'm also reminded that historic narrative, whether it's written documents or monuments, photographs or film, are never neutral. And here uh, at the Onward Project, we have tens of thousands of assets from Rainbow Bridge Monument Valley Expedition in the, from the 1930s. It was the largest expedition and the last of its kind in the Southwest. But we also had the goal and were given tremendous opportunities to take some of this content back to the Navajo communities, to the Navajo Nation Fair, Pioneer Day at Navajo Mountain, and to collaborate with families who we met and to hear their stories um, as they were associated with the expedition or to the landscape who, and people who live in the area and still do today. With our immersive storytelling platforms we have created, we will continue to pay very serious attention to the call to represent a fuller history of a place and include many voices, many of those that were voices kept silent or muted historically. Before I begin, I wanna dedicate this event to three people who are close to our Onward Project Circle who passed away recently. Two are members of the Little Salt family, Jimmy Austin Jr and Chester Salt Jr. Both were grandsons of Max Little Salt, a well-known guide and interpreter on the Navajo reservation. And were, he was related for years with the Rainbow Bridge Monument Valley Expedition. And also to Marilyn Beaudry Corbett, who was a tremendously successful businesswoman and went on to another career in uh, very decorated in archeology. span but she also was a huge supporter of mine for the last 15 years. And uh, she and her husband really made it possible for us to begin our nonprofit five years ago and to continue uh, all of our work. Today, we have seven storytellers and readers. Some are very personal family memories that we will be hearing. And one is speaking about community memory. Um, and that is equally as important not to be lost. We also have readings from historic diaries, letters, monographs, which are very much products of their time, but they give us an incredible insight into day-to-day -day workings and interactions between people on the expedition, both people who lived on the land and uh, the outsiders who came in. Some of our readers are actually descended from people who uh, they are telling stories about or reading uh, from their diaries. And so without much uh, any further ado, I'd like to introduce Tony Palermo. He is our producer for this event and my co-host. He is a radio dramatist and director, writer, and sound effects expert. He has over 25 performances under his belt and has worked with the likes of Eric Idle, LA Theater Works, and many more. I'm now handing the mic over to Tony. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, good afternoon, Onward fans. Uh, because this is a Zoom cast and due to the vagaries of differing internet connections, you may experience some out of syncness between video and audio. If you're having cocktails, it may appear even more so. 
Uh, but don't worry, you run no risk of being cited for ZUI, zooming under the influence. Do note that some of our storytellers are not loud people. If one of our speakers speaks too quietly, just turn up the volume on your speaker. The storytellers have recorded their videos and audios, and I will serve as the video jockey or VJ, introducing each one. Which brings me to our first story. Ansel Hall was a director and organizer of the Rainbow Bridge Monument Valley Expedition for six field seasons from 1933 to 1936. While on the road, Ansel had his vehicle outfitted with a backseat portable desk so he could maximize his work output. We're going to hear a 1936 Ansel Hall radio speech recreated here by his grandson, Jack Turner. Roll the audio of that speech. To the east of Navajo Mountain lies the vast stretches of Monument Valley, where spires and columns of sandstone rise half a thousand feet out of the mesquite and sage-covered plains. Even to the natives, the Monument Valley is known as bad country for anyone who may not know its water holes. But it is picturesque, colorful, intriguing. It beckons to the modern explorer. Into this land of the northern Navajo, went a party of explorers four years ago. Volunteers, men drawn from the staff and student body of universities and colleges throughout the country, ended together in a cooperative venture which would permit them to enter this forbidding country and to bring out reports of its scenic features, of its cliff dwellings, of its unknown geology and fauna and flora. In June of 1933, therefore, two automobile caravans converged upon the Navajo country one which had started from the University of California in Berkeley and the other from the Explorers Club in New York City. The expedition was fortunate indeed in having an airplane for scouting this new country. After we first built our own landing field, for the nearest airport was 175 miles away to the south, we made reconnaissance flights out over Monument Valley, over the canyons of the San Juan and Colorado, around Navajo Mountain, we soon discovered that we had on our hands a problem of mapping and studying not only the three or 400 square miles that we had anticipated, but instead a vast, scenic, colorful area more than 3,000 square miles. Ansel Hall's radio address was read by Jack Turner, his grandson. Jack is a past Olympic competitor in skiing and has had a career in coordinating and announcing extreme sports events. He's currently running for county commissioner in the state of Colorado. Next. Ray Garner was a 25 year old photographer and filmmaker for the 1937 expedition. In Ray's extensive journals, written home to his future wife, we get to know a young man who had less practical experience, but an impressive amount of determination. Ray provided the expedition with wonderful documentation, as well as working on an advertising film produced by the Ford Motor Company. Roll cameraman, speed, action. Went down to pay a last visit to the Nevels. Broke camp, left for Monument Valley at eight o'clock. Stopped at Mexican Hat Bridge and the entrance to the monument to take pictures. At Goulding's, we stopped to buy provisions. Harry Goulding, a typical Western character, long, lean, and lazy, took us upstairs into his living room to show us his photos of the Double Rainbow Bridge. He discovered it while guiding a party of three girls about this time last year. One of the girls had a Leica. The pictures show the shape and character of the bridge well, but are poor photographically. Goulding has never published an account of his find, so its identity is only known to a few people here in Navajo country. It has not been revisited. Naturally, Beckwith was much interested. He told Goulding that we were equipped to get some real good photographs of it. He even said that he'd fly Goulding over it when the plane came. Gamby said that he'd like to be the first man to paint it. Cut off on a wagon trail just south of Chesla. Spied an Indian boy out on the plain. Goulding waved him over and held a long musical conversation in Navajo. He said that his brother would guide us into a carry-on about two miles away from the spot. 
he rode off. About 10 minutes later, we were on our way with an Indian boy directing. We drove along the wash in the bottom of a deep high-walled canyon. Asked Goulding the name of this place. He said that we could start naming things from now on, ourselves. We're moving into unknown country. Left the car at the head of a wash, packed up some food and water, and started to thread our way through a maze of twisted canyon, wilder than I've ever seen so far. Our party consists of Gamby, Beckwith, Goulding, and our Indian boy. About 14, his name in Navajo means the left-handed man's boy with mustache, his son. Took movies of the trek through the canyons. Came upon a huge cave with a ruin thereon. The tower, eight feet high, is a round two-story dwelling. The timbers of both floors and roof of upper story in excellent state of preservation. One timber in particular is eight and a half inches in diameter and shows all annual rings perfectly. The Indian boy's family have lived here for years. He says that no white man, except Goulding, has ever been here before. We continued along this cave dwelling canyon until we emerged into a small stretch of open desert with a sandstone plateau on the left. Continued along this wall, ignoring all turn off carry ons until we came to a steep walled canyon with cotton with cottonwood at its mouth. An unmistakable landmark is a three trunked fan shaped tall cottonwood about a hundred yards down this canyon. We took a turn to the left and suddenly came upon the double rainbow. When Goulding first discovered it, June 5, 1936, he was guiding a party of three girls. It's difficult to describe its shape. I'll show you the pictures of it, Beckwith's pictures, I mean. It is impossible to get it all in close-up views. Luckily, the sky had cleared and the lighting on the bridge was real good. Goulding, on his first visit, had not been able to climb up on top of it. I was trying to climb it, with Goulding ready to catch me on the rope, when the left-handed man's boy with mustache, his son, took off his shoes and walked right past me. I threw him the rope and went up, hand over hand. These Navajos have an extra pair of hands attached to their legs instead of feet. I think I could have climbed it, but not with safety. Went on alone, climbed the rocks up to the west portal of the bridge and out on top of it. The first man to ever stand on top of the double rainbow. Ate lunch under the arch and spent all afternoon taking pictures. Beckwith took 80 in all. One of me standing on top. Goulding and I tried to measure the height of the bridge but my 100-foot rope wouldn't reach. We finally got it by tying our two shirts, our belts, my camera strap, and the Indian's neckerchief to the end of the rope. Beckwith got pictures of the proceedings. Probably the most unique natural bridge made for me. It's 13 feet from the top to the base, with a total clearance underneath the arch of slightly under 100 feet. Ray's letters were read by Ben Benjamin, a writer, programmer, and graphics master based in Los Angeles. Ben is the creator of the Onward Project website and the creator and animator of the online graphic biography of Max Littlesalt, we'll be hearing later. Now we're going to take a break for the auction and I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Jack Turner and Ben Benjamin. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, fundraising portion of this event that we have had an auction running for the past week and it will culminate pro approximately half an hour after this event um, concludes. Um, it's so important to our continuing our work um, to raise funds and uh, we so appreciate all of you who have helped us um, to uh, during this very difficult time. But I do want to point out some of our amazing items. Uh, many of these are donated by our 
supporters or our board members. Uh, one is this amazing white uh, handmade rug by Sally Yahtzee. She's a 90 year old uh, woman. She's a, been a weaver her whole life. Uh, she is blind and um, she, uh, this rug was bought through an Adopt the Elder, Native Elder program, which helps elderly artists and artisans find a marketplace for their beautiful uh, goods. And this was donated by one of our board members who comes from Navajo Mountain. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have some really wonderful experiences that are available. One is the virtual tour by uh, Eric Hansen. He's our uh, virtual reality developer. He's a professor at USC and he's done a lot of work with Hollywood. Um, but he has also been a state uh, department representative in countries around the world um, recording and documenting cultural heritage sites. And um, he will give you a, vir a virtual tour by Zoom of his studio and show you a lot of his recent work, which is astounding and, and covers the globe. Um, I also want to point out um, this amazing watercolor by one of our volunteers, Mary D. Donnan. And uh, she really does evoke the Southwest, a place that she has loved and traveled to for most of her life. Um, I'd also like to point out a wonderful uh, donation by one of our board members, Dr. Annie Dennis. Um, she is a recent PhD graduate from, uh, from Berkeley, and she's offering two one-hour classes for young people. Uh, one is um, Ask an Archaeologist, and the other is uh, Whose Land Do You Live On? And uh, these would be perfect for parents who uh, are working at home and would like to find something for their children to do for an hour during the workday. And Annie will, uh, will make the program uh, for uh, whatever age group that is. Um, so I hope you uh, will look at our auction. We will be giving you a link um, at the uh, intermission. Um, and of course, then you can visit at the end. Tony, back to you. Okay, the next story is Jerry Hansen who was a 57-year-old high school teacher who joined a 1937 exp expedition as the head of mapping and topography. His accounts cover the dynamics between expedition members and the local native community, in addition to detailing the survey processes at the time. Jerry accomplished a tremendous amount during his one field season, creating with his large team of students, finished and detailed maps of the land. Roll video of the letter from Jerry Hansen. This is the story of a summer vacation spent by Jerry Hansen. In May 1937, I received an invitation from Mr. Ansel Hall, director of the Rainbow Bridge Monument Valley Expedition, to join the expedition as chief topographer. The record of this expedition was not altogether unknown to me, for I had read of the scientific work accomplished by the archaeologists, geologists, biologists, and engineers in that section of the Navajo Reservation, which is so interesting as the home of a prehistoric race. My, out <clears throat> my outfit was thrown into the back seat of my car on the morning of June 18th, and with Leora and Billy, I started on the first leg of the journey to Berkeley, where I was to join a section of the Western Caravan. The next morning, the various members of the group met at the Federal Land Bank building. There was Herbert Crowell, instructor of surveying in the University of California, who was to serve as assistant topographer, Waldemar Doyle, head of the scientific department of the McClatchy High School in Sacramento, the photographer, Dr. Babington, the expedition physician, and Stuart Mitchell, university student, who has been a member of the 1936 expedition. Doyle was sent to Los Angeles with one of the Ford station wagons to pick up a group there and meet us in Barstow at three o'clock on Sunday afternoon. At 10.30 in the morning, we left Berkeley, Crowell and I drove the station wagon, in which $1,500 worth of surveying instruments were carefully packed. Dr. Babington and Mitchell drove the other car. As we rambled along the smooth highways, my thoughts reverted to the days when I had tramped behind pack trains in British Columbia many years ago, as our survey party was made, uh, made its way into the Caribou and the Peace River country. Could I come back after so many years of sedentary life? I did. There were two things necessary for a good camp, a good cook and good water. Our cook was a young chap named Jim Hart. Jim had lived among the Indians and could carry on a conversation 
with the Navajos in their own language. His kitchen was in the open air and his stove was a fireplace built of rocks. Dutch ovens were used for the baking of bread, biscuits, and meat. The food was always placed on a table. And in response to Jim's, come and get her, we lined up and helped ourselves. We each carried the plate of food and, cup, and a cup of coffee or chocolate to his favorite dining room, which might be a rock, a log, or an air mattress. Our plates and cups were tin. For breakfast, we could have, have, we could have scrambled eggs, oatmeal, biscuits, coffee and canned fruit, powdered milk called Klim mixed with water and was a perfect substitute for the bottled milk delivered at your door. Oranges or fresh peaches were on the table most of the time to prevent scurvy. Fresh beef, mutton or ham were sizzling in the Dutch oven for the evening meal. <clears throat> the engineers were not in camp at noon. Each man wrapped his lunch in a bandana handkerchief and tied it behind his back, a spring of good Cold water was located near the camp. Upon our arrival at camp, and after three or four mile walk from work, our first act was to take a shower by dashing basins of cold water over our bodies. From the time we left camp in the morning until our return at night, we had no water except for which we had in our canteen. And during the day, it became very warm, almost hot, but believe me, really thirsty, even warm water is acceptable. The temptation was strong to fill up on the cold water and made no room for the evening meal. A campfire in front of her Herb's bed and mine made our location the social center in the evening. Pipes and cigarettes were lighted and comfortable positions and comfortable positions were taken on my bed. I've seen as many as six sitting on my bed at one time and expected every night to hear my air mattress pop like an overinflated balloon. One night, while in bed, we listened to a storm approaching from the distance. The sound of wind became louder and louder until the storm broke over our heads. Herb and I did our fire drill, that is, pulled our tarp up over our heads and fastened it. The wind struck us like a hurricane, and the remaining coals of our campfire until they glowed white hot and blew the tin dishes off the cook's table and sent them clattering up the canyon. Ghostly, half-clad figures climbed out of their beds and with flashlights and, and with flashlights began looking for lost underwear and towels. The thunder was loud and so close that the ground actually shook. My greatest concern was to keep the live coals from burning holes in our sleeping bags. So when the wind was at its worst, I was shoveling the live coals over the bank into the canyon below. The storm subsided, <clears throat> the storm subsided quickly and a good, -natured gang of fellow, a good natured gang of fellows again retired to finish their sleep. And so after two months to the day, we finished one of the finest summer vacation trips that a person could have. There was plenty of hard work. There were congenial companions. There were new experiences in a new environment. And above all, a feeling of satisfaction that we had made a small contribution to scientific research. Jerry Hansen's letter was read by Mike Fair, a fine furniture maker and artist working in Los Angeles and a supporter of the Onward Project. Next, we have some readings from Max Littlesalt, a graphic biography, the Onward Project's newly published online book. Max Littlesalt was 34 and living in the canyons with his family, raising livestock and farming when the expedition hired him as a guide and interpreter. The watercolors you will see were created by Shay Houston, whose mother is from Navajo Mountain. The text was conceived by Samantha Hassani. Both were 2019 summer interns for the Onward Project. Note that Charles Littlesalt will be reading from his father Max's story, first in English and then in Navajo. But we'll first begin with the life of my grandfather, Max Littlesalt, has intrigued me my entire life. He's spent nine decades, and in those decades, what a life he led. He had a great courage to leave the Navajo reservation as a young man to seek higher education in a white man's world. Upon his return to the reservation, he dedicated his life as a civil servant to his community. This graphic biography is based on stories told by my uncle, Charlie Little Salt, who is Max's son. The graphic biography idea was formed at the Onward Project's first conference five years ago 
the attendees at the conference were divided into small groups. In one of those groups, my mother Louise came up with the idea of a comic book to tell Max's story. Max was born in 1904. His family followed the hearth by season, migrating between Shanto and the canyon land south of Navajo Mountain. That when Arizona was still a territory. Each year they would make the journey again. It's changed in 一番<音楽><音楽><音楽><音楽> It on the territories and it on Arushin Anakahi. When he was old enough, Max chose to go to high school at Haskell Institute in Lawrence, Kansas. He liked Lawrence. During the break, he stayed at school. He worked to earn enough spending money. When he was in school, he, he got good grades. So he got a position in the only all Indian Calvary Union, Union unit at Fort Bradley nearby. Uh, Haskell was together at this discussion with the notion. I don't think all not to see in the North Kansas was originally. Oh, she just couldn't add it to the style of what she knew what she was rushing all the tigers and stuff. I don't think I was just so I think it's washing in natural. So it best I guess she didn't know yet. I don't think I was tiger. I don't just tiger in general. What she said. While working with the expedition, Max made a friend named Lloyd Lowry. The two of them talked about what Max called Indian science and about how some studied the moon and the stars to predict the seasons. He told him of Dene, who went to Skeleton Mesa every four years to gather pinyon nuts, which they could then sell for $15 a sack. He told Lowry Dene legends and showed him Paiute Canyon. He explained how we planted peaches and apricots trees from pits. Our family always raised good fruit trees. He also told him of when the U.S. government passed the 1933 Navajo Livestock Reduction Act, where they cut our herds, only paying us $10 an animal. After they all came back, Max was given another hat to wear. The community appointed him as a judge for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Court of in the in the offense, it was unanimous. Unanimous. He was known by the net as Anahu I Joppa, meaning the the kind judge. Ishi, <laughs> 
Örüt nek I remembered a month after Max passed, my niece rounded up all my nieces and nephews and went down to Tsayit in the trucks. They drove all the way up the canyon to the ruins in Kitsil and back. They laughed, cried, told jokes. They shared stories about their grandfather, Max. They were happy to be together. They knew that Max would have wanted them to remember them in their own way. And we heard Lithuania Denetso, a longtime researcher, liaison, and collaborator with the Onward Project. She's been a healthcare worker for 23 years, and although not on the front lines of the pandemic, she's been working from home as a care coordinator for a Tucson hospital. Joining Lithuania was her uncle Charles Little Salt, Max's son, who is a generous consulting family historian to the Onward Project. Charles also is trustee to the local Canyons for the Little Salt and Austin families, the same region where his father Max was a major guide for the expedition. Now, auction break number two, and tell us what we're bidding on, Elizabeth Kahn. Thank you, Tony, and thank you to Mike Fair and Lithuania Donetso and uh, Charles Little Salt. Uh, we hope you enjoyed these really special stories. Um, and uh, I want to talk about another amazing thing that's related to Lithuania and her mother, Louise. Um, which was a COVID-19 sequester project to learn the kumihimo beading technique. Um, it's a Japanese beading technique that is uh, based on the historic rope making, multi-stranded rope making techniques of the uh, Japanese. And it was men who practiced this art and now it has come into bead making and uh, it's very complex. And uh, they sat down at five o'clock every night to uh, take classes to learn um, this amazing technique and ordered beads from Japan. And uh, we have 10 of these beautiful necklaces uh, as part of our auction. So please go take a look. Um, and uh, I think what's also very special is that they chose the colors to match the season we are in, which is of course summer. And uh, you can feel the, those wonderful colors in, in the necklaces. So uh, back to you, Tony. All right, our next story. Grace Hoover was an experienced photographer in her 30s when she was recruited by Ansel Hall to join the 1934 expedition. She was one of only two women in the field. Grace was accompanied by her husband, Charles Hoover, and took on every activity with enthusiasm even volunteering to drive the oversized Ford trucks down the steep canyon roads. Here's Grace wearing a pith helmet and jodhpurs, standard garb for many 1930s adventurers. Let's hear from Grace's evocative diary entries. This is a story from the diary of Grace Hoover, a photographer on the 1934 expedition. Kayenta Camp, 4th of July at the Weatherall Trading Post and not a firecracker to be heard. It is 10 o'clock and all is quiet on the weather off front. Indians have been coming in from all sections for the celebration. The Sege members of the expedition reached Cayenta this afternoon and there was activity on every side. Three or four of them had not shaved thus far and possessed various designs of beards. We were glad to hear about events at Camp Anasazi. In the evening, there was a dance at the hospital and most of us were there. It began at 8.30, and the lights, in accordance with government regulations, went out at 10 o'clock, so it was a short party. July 5th, my husband and I went up to the desert a few miles to a landing field which had been dragged in readiness for the arrival of Ansel Hall and his party. We knew only they would be flying in that day, but not the hour of arrival. Everyone was keenly interested because no plane had flown over Cayenta since November. At 2.30 p.m., we assembled again, both wagons and a trunk full of students, the Weatherall car, 
and some few others parked neatly in a row. 15 minutes later, we sighted the plane coming in out of the blue. About a mile beyond the landing field was the encampment of Navajos who had been gathering for days. Because of the undulating surface of the land, we had frequently noticed how quickly one loses sight of people, cars, horses, or even small settlements. For this reason, we were scarcely aware of the number of Indians and horses that had assembled at this place. Everyone was excited and the Navajos began riding up. Finally, on the third attempt, the plane dropped down beautifully on the narrow, short clearing. And I think I never had such concentrated thrills as when I saw that horde of Indians seemingly rise up out of the ground and charge across the intervening desert, sending a great cloud of dust high into the air. The pilot made an excellent landing. Suddenly, where 10 minutes before all had been an empty desert stage with Black Mesa for a background and clouds for wings, there was a great crowd of Indians, horses and white people in good looking clothes, stepping out of the cabin, greetings, cameras clicking and much darting about. Ansel Hall introduced me to the visitors and I made photographs of them and the landing scenes. Then the party was driven off to Kayanta and I stayed to catch some camera trophies among the Navajo who were so interested in watching the pilots cover the hoods on the motors that they forgot to watch me. The night of July 5th should be recorded wholly in italics. It was difficult to believe we were in the modern world and the USA at that. At dusk, we all went out to the Indian encampment. The women were still cooking meat, bread, and coffee at small family groups or in the large temporary hogan constructed of juniper and pignon, providing shelter for about 40 Navajo. There were two fires burning with the women frying their bread in deep fat, producing what looked to me like a very large, sophisticated pancake. While men and women and children set about, babies were put to sleep on sheepskins in the rear. Hearing a chorus of men's voices in another direction, we went off to listen to the singing. It provided to be two groups of Navajo men standing very close together, facing one another, each group apparently trying to sing the other down. They were shoulder to shoulder, breast to back, and swayed as they sang. My husband and I joined the other and entered into the singing at the top of our voices. As the songs would reach its end on one side, a Navajo on the other side would take it up in high falsetto and would instantly be joined by his companions. While we tried to guess what the next note might be, they knew every word, every inflection, and knew them perfectly. How young they must have been when they were taught these songs. My husband nudged me and I nudged back. He said afterwards that he could not even hear his own voice. We stayed for some time swaying with the rhythm in that compact body of Indians and singing with all our might. The trip home to California. It was 5.30 p.m. when we took leave of the Weatheralls who had written into our best chapter such a delightful episode. We drove all night. Sometime before dawn, I woke to a clear realization that we would shortly be back in the rush of demands, varied and insistent. Well, one would certainly be loath to give up his place in the world's activity. And should the clamor of this universe become too harsh, he could assuredly turn his ears to other voices more kindly. I settled back into the hollow I had dented in my husband's shoulder and, as we rumbled along towards home, stowed away in memory the sounds, voices of our safari that must not be forgotten. The splash of hooves through running water, wind in the pinyon pines on the top of the mesa, the exquisite melody of the canyon wren, whinnying of an Indian pony, the tinkle of sheep bells, Navajo Song on the Desert. Pages from Grace Hoover's diary were read by Mary D. Donnan, a longtime volunteer to the Onward Project. Mary D. is in charge of wrangling the metadata for over 30,000 records in Onward's digital archive. And now, there'll be a five minute intermission. During the interval, please visit our auction page, as this is an Onward fundraiser after all. You can click on links in the Zoom chat area at the bottom of your Zoom screen. 
They'll take you to the auction page or to donate directly to Onward. Clicking on the links will not end your Zoom session. They'll just open another window, I believe. We'll still be here patiently waiting. Now, please note that the auction ends about a half an hour after our Zoom cast. Of course, you can always donate to the Onward Project. And as it was back in pre-COVID-19 intermissions, we'll bang a gong signaling we're about to resume Zooming you. Five minutes.
backstory. Lloyd Lowry was a 34-year-old high school teacher and principal when he first joined the expedition as part of the geology and paleontology crew. Lloyd made friends with Max Littlesalt, who shared his knowledge of a fossil in the area, which turned out to be the most significant paleontological find that summer. Lloyd went on to serve in the California State Legislature from 1940 to 1962, carrying on a lifelong advocacy for Native American rights. Here's a bit of Lloyd Lowry's journals from 1933. July 23rd, up at 4.40 a.m. Had to move my bed last night, too much noise. Milt asked me to help Max drive burrows to rim a Paiute Canyon while we went with a truck to show the way. I accepted and rode the mule named Chipmunk. It was an enjoyable ride and a chance to talk with Max. After lunch, we left with Jack's, jackasses that is, packed at 12.30 p.m. We walked till 5.30 p.m. when we arrived at Hawk's Nest Camp, where there is a fine spring of water. There are only 15 fellows left with the group now. One burrow, number 13, was left behind. Max had to go back after him. Just an extra three hours riding for him. July 24th, 1933, up at 4.45 a.m., on the way by 7.45 a.m., after a fine night's sleep on my rock shelf platform. The air was exceedingly crisp, could not take elevation, as barometer does not read over 6,000 feet. Milt had prophesied a long, hard walk, but the cool air and well-behaved jacks made the trip an easy one. We were in camp by 1.50 p.m. Our first camp, just down in Sege Canyon, was passed up due to lack of water. Our camp here at Jackass Spring is quite fine. Max told me an interesting story of Navajo legend after dinner. This was led up to by a discussion of great erosion here, which has practically ruined farming spots in this little valley. Cliff dwellers, first drought, then wet, washed out all the sand. Sickness, many years of gentle wind and rain brought silt into canyon again, lakes formed. This is evident by recent deposits shown on sides of the washed gully. Legend says, lakes to be washed out again. Indians die young. They used to live over 100 years and get gray early, but bad weather, new winds, Great floods caused the end of the world as it happened to the cliff dwellers. New weeds came in and old disappeared. Max's Indians now die young, gray early. Tumbleweeds appear in canyons. In the last 40 years, lakes and lands have washed away and to continue until the end comes. Four years ago, due to drought, all Indians lived here, and the feed was all eaten in two summers. This has aided erosion caused by a huge sheet of water in a very heavy rainy season. Max also told of Indian science, as he called it. Some study the stars and moon to predict seasons. He says they can tell pretty well, too. Indians go on skeleton mesa every four years to gather pinon nuts which they sell for $15 a sack, used to get $25 per sack. Yesterday, Max told me how they plant fruit trees from pits, raising good fruit trees, peaches and apricots. His uncle traded for pits some years ago while at the races in Tuba City. I saw the trees which resulted, not cultivated or pruned. The government cut their herds of horses and cattle some years ago paid about $10 per head. Max wonders why this was done. In his early 80s, Lloyd went to Cayente, Arizona to seek out Max Little Salt, and so they met again after almost 45 years. Lloyd Lowry's journal entries were read by Tim Lowry, retired professor of botany at the University of New Mexico. He's Lloyd's youngest son. Our next 
Now some valuable context provided by archaeologist Ron Maldonado. From 1998 to 2015, Ron served as the Cultural Resources Compliance Officer in the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation District Department. He was acting Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Navajo Nation from 2013 to 2015. And here's Ron speaking from his pretty big backyard where it's a bit windy. Hi, my name is Ron Maldonado. I'm a retired archaeologist. I live and work here on the Navajo Nation. The Navajo have a saying that sheep is life. And to them, sheep was a sacred gift from changing the woman and from the deities. The sheep provided to them wool, uh, food basically on the hoof, and it really changed the way the Navajo lived in prehistoric or in historic times. Uh, they would follow the herds uh, to the highlands, to the high forest during the, during the summertime where it was cooler, and then move them down to the flats in the wintertime when there was less snow. But essentially, they formed these lasting relationships with their herds. Uh, they would take care of them and, and herd them, move them from place to place, but they would also use the wool from them. They would, they would shear them, carve the wool, spin it in, in the yarn, and weave rugs. They would use the pelts for bedding as well as for, for, uh, for clothing. And so the sheep represented essentially life itself. It, it was food source, it was a source of e economics to the Navajo people. In the 1930s, the federal government enacted uh, the Stock Reduction Act, which essentially decimated the herds out here on, in Navajo land. There are stories of, of, of families that had five, 6,000 head of sheep and, and goats. And these, and these were destroyed. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of animals were, were slaughtered and left to rot in the sun. And some of the elders tell stories about you know, they, when, they were, when they saw this, they saw their parents and their grandparents crying because they saw their animals being slaughtered and saw their livelihood go away. So when the Rainbow Bridge expedition showed up in, in the Monument Valley, uh, it was interesting because they brought essentially a cash economy with them uh, to that general that area and they provided cash directly to the trader who, who would hold the cash for the families. He would set up his ledger book and with credit lines and then when the family would come in and needing supplies, he would deduct it from them. But, but that really was kind of one of the first introductions of the cash economy here on the Nala Reservation because it, it started essentially in Exodus um, from the reservation with stock reduction and, and, st and livestock being, being slaughtered and gone. Families needed to provide themselves in different ways. And so a lot of them turned towards that cash economy. And the only way to do that was to, was to work essentially. They became guides, they became uh, sheep herders, uh, quite interestingly off the reservation. And a lot of them became migrant uh, farm pickers. Uh, they went to Colorado, southern Colorado, and then to Utah to, to work on the farms as, as farm laborers, uh, migrant workers work, working in the summers, and then returning home in the wintertime and then moving again uh, up, up back up to the Col in Colorado and Utah. There are a lot of Navajos, uh, Navajo males actually worked the railroads in the early 1930s and into the 50s and 60s. And it's quite interesting that a, that a lot of them traveled the railroads across the country, uh, but they would always return back to Navajo. There, there's that draw here that, that, that brings you back to Navajo. And so you can see that, that it seems almost, you had this, this expedition show up at almost at the right time because it, it introduced monies to the families, that, monies that were given to the family. Because not all the monies were going to the traders, because essentially they could go out and trade with dollars and pocket the money, and, and it gave them the ability to to kind of look for bargains, you know, because you weren't necessarily tied down to one trading post anymore. You could always go to a different trading post and you know spend your money there, or go to Gallup or Shiprock or Farmington, one of the bigger cities around the reservation. Uh, 
So, you know, again, you know, when you think about sheep and, and the way Navajos think about sheep, even to this day, it is, it is a central part of who they are. Uh, when the ceremonies are done, they, they sit on sheepskins. Uh, rugs are still woven. Uh, small herds are, are, still, are still herded across the reservation. And they become an essential part of the Navajo people and the Navajo culture. Thank you. Ron Maldonado has been associated with the Onward Project for 10 years in official capacities and has continued as a key consultant. Ron currently serves as a member of the Onward Board. Well, as Max Littlesalt would say, that's it uh, for the stories. But there's still the auction finale. You have about a half an hour. Um, I'll hand it over to Elizabeth Kahn. There, there's still time to bid, right, Elizabeth? Yes, thank you so much, Tony. And I want to thank our readers and storytellers. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed this very unique uh, way of, of experiencing history. Um, I want to thank uh, Tony Palermo for helping us to produce this event and for co-hosting. And behind the scenes, um, I can't give enough thanks to Maddie Fair, who did all of the film editing and also photographed and put up and designed that beautiful auction site. Um, and of course, she's helping to make this event run smoothly today. And I also want to um, thank Allison Fisher Olson, our wonderful researcher. She has a photographic memory. And, um, and so she is the one who put together the bios um, for all of the different characters and um, did the photo research and collected the different photos but that you saw interspersed in the videos. Um, I also want to thank Ben Benjamin. He is our website designer and artist and digital artist and he uh, was the uh, correspondent in our chat today. So uh, the auction ends, yes, in um, just a little less than half an hour. Um, so please visit the site, or if you prefer to give a direct donation, then please visit um, the website. The link to the donation page is in the chat. Um, the event has been recorded and will be posted on our website. Um, I want to point out that these shirts that you see that all of the readers uh, are wearing, we had these made by Mary D. Donnan um, and uh, she hand stenciled them to bring them up to date. They are based on the historic originals that the men wore in the expedition and we're selling some of these on the auction site today. Um, but uh, check out our social media and website for further details and to follow our project. And um, this concludes the event for today. So stay tuned for further online events. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>